Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. We are going through the Gospel of John. This is our second time doing this. We learned how to look at a book thanks to Tao Te Ching, going through Tao Te Ching, and we're trying to repeat that for the Bible. So the format is we're going to start by reading the entire chapter, the first chapter through, and then we will read the uh, you know, one through 18. And then we're going to discuss one through 18. Once we're done with that discussion, we are going to go further. We are going to go section by section. We will have somebody read it and then we can talk about it. Let's, we'll just focus primarily on the text uh, and go from there. So really looking forward to this. So Baron, could you read the first chapter? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness, to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received, grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. And this is the testimony of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain. This is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him and say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him for that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and follow Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, 
We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Thanks, Farad. Thanks, Farad. Next up is going to be Pegor. Pegor, if you could read just the first 1 through 18. Yep. Okay. Can you guys hear me well? Yes. Okay. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, sorry, um, uh, can you go ahead and put the mic right next to your mouth? Okay. Is, is this better? A little better. Okay. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who became in his, to, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, this was he of whom I said, he who came after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Thank you, Pegor. Um, now. Anybody who wants is welcome to comment on it. Uh, last time we discussed one through 13. So we are primarily discussing 14 through 18, but you're welcome to bring up anything um, between. So now the floor is open. Go ahead and type an exclamation mark or raise your hand in Zoom in order to speak. Kevin. Yeah, just want to repeat. I, I'm reading is the Bible hub in internet. One word is uh, the word in uh, Greek uh, translated to logos. So I give a read like first couple sentences with logos would be like this. In the beginning was the logos and the logo was with God. Uh, the God, God was the word. So by the way, God is a son also. It's, it's, uh, the meaning is if we uh, basically cross the original, it's very interesting. We talk about the logos and uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Next up is David Norton. Okay, I had to unmute myself here. Um, uh, let me see. What I wanted to comment on was um, number 14 there, and it says, and the word was made flesh and dwells among us. And then in parentheses, it says, and, 
and we beheld his glory. And the we he's talking about is his disciples. And I look at that as disciples of the past, present, and future. And it says the glory as the only begotten son of the father, full of grace and truth. One thing I do find in the teachings of Jesus through the gospels is that he defines his own, everything that's sort of being said. And uh, I find a definition here in John 14, 22 through 26 regarding this. When uh, Judas, he asked Jesus, he says, how is it that you will manifest and dwell yourself into my flesh and not into the people of the world? And then Jesus responded and he said, if a person loves me, he will keep my words or my commands um, and the in the experienced reality of these words or edicts will live in that person in that way my father and i will abode in the flesh of that person he that does not love me will not keep my sayings and commands and the words which you hear them speak are not mine and then it goes on to say, and the comforter or the Holy Spirit, the Father will send. It will teach you all things and bring all things into your remembrance that I have said to you. So in other words, you have to understand his commandments in order for this here to be born into a person's flesh. Because once you've taken and experienced the reality of the words that he's actually speaking, it becomes part of a person's, you know, they use the reference flesh, but it becomes almost a spontaneous thing of what uh, it actually lives in a person's whole being. And the things that he are taught by Jesus through his commands that he gives, um, to me, they're absolute truths that um, once a person comes into realization of them, they never are can be taken away because they will always use these truths to measure all aspects of life. It's not only a spiritual thing, but it's a thing when you walk out the door every single day that you're using these principles that Jesus Christ gives you to live by and to communicate with others. And, um, you know, he, he goes on and it says at the very end of the chapter in John 14, he says, my peace I give to you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it ever be afraid. For when you know the absolute truths that he teaches, there's no fear in them. That's all I got to say. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, next up is going to be uh, Jacob, Joe, Cheryl, Gary, and Evanique. Uh, Jacob, welcome back. Go ahead. Hi there. Um, this is sort of a question, I suppose. I'm, I'm referring to verse, just verse one. I know we're going back and I guess this, the question is, I don't know if you've had an in-depth discussion about, about this first verse and the, the alternative renderings of it, because, well, if you don't get the first verse straight, you're probably not going to get the chapter straight. Uh, Jake, so, um, uh, please, please take your time and make your point. Uh, though we have covered it, this is something well worth covering multiple times. Please go ahead. Okay, okay, good. So I, I'm... My memory might be a bit off, but I think the Rotherham translation, the Moffat translation, the New World translation are examples where John 1.1 1, 1 reads instead, uh, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was a God, or the word was divine. Um, so <laughs> again, this is less a comment than it is an opening to a, a vast discussion. So this might be badly placed, um, but it's, it's hard for me to have a discussion about chapter without the whole chapter, and unless there's some sort of consensus on what verse one is, what the proper rendering of verse one is. So where have you guys gotten on that? There's we have a whole question. whole video on that. Uh, I'll, I'll send you a link, but okay. uh, let's, uh, let, let's continue. But you know, everybody is welcome to bring back anything that we have discussed before, because there is a conceptual hierarchy. So, so thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Joe, Cheryl, Gary, and Evanique. Joe. So um, there's a couple different ways that we can kind of go approach this. Uh, you know, one is the way that we have discussed in the past um, is uh, in the beginning was the word. 
and that the word is truth and uh, that the idea that God became man and he's, that he's became flesh and that is representing the ideal of this world and the potential of this world. Um, the other is that through truth that you can extract the good from the world. So how do you engage the chaos of the world? There's order and chaos and you bring order through words, through truthful words. And you take that and you start to um, uh, be able to act in the world in a meaningful way. So that then is, you can assume what is good in that, uh, in that context. So that it, there's this idea that you're, then if you can decide what is good, it's also bringing order to chaos, but then you can also determine what is also bad and what is not good, which is obviously false. So the word truth is actually even used uh, quite at the, um, I tell you the truth, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. Well, it, but it's the use of the word truth over and over that I, I kind of find to be very important because again, uh, just as I think Jacob had mentioned as the word being divine, uh, that is kind of important because if the word's divine, then that also helps you uh, bring order to chaos. That's just my, my thought, my initial thoughts anyway. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Next up is Cheryl followed by Gary. Cheryl. Yeah, um, I was uh, listening to last week's um, video that I enjoyed very much. And um, it made me think of just one other thing to add about the, 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 first, um, the first three sentences about, um, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. It reminded me of the analogy, so to speak, of a man or a woman presenting possessing physical eggs or um, the, the necessary seeds of procreation. And how, how would you describe that before there was a medical journal? And you would say, well, there was a man and, the man, and, and his children were with him. Um, and, uh, you know, he, it, it, he would, like he was, there was a man and the children were with him. And, you're in, and you look at the man and you think, well, how are the children with you? Well, you know, the, just like your children are with you before they're born. Um, the, the son was with the father before he was born. So I think it just kind of sets up that uh, relationship because it goes on to say um, that um, it's a, he gives the right to become children of God, um, not of the natural descent or of human decision or of a husband's will, but born of God. So he kind of descends that right to everybody to be born of God, regardless of physical uh, flesh and how the word became flesh, we all become flesh. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, next up is going to be Gary, Evanique, uh, Dave, and Shakem. Gary. Um, for, first off, I just wanted to thank you for the suggestion. Um, you mentioned uh, listening to uh, the Gospel of John on audio, like on YouTube, and that was just so helpful. And um, I found myself like, like doing that again and again and getting a whole picture of, of the book. Uh, so yes, thank you for that, <laughs> that suggestion, it's really good. Uh, what, what struck me is um, we talked about a little bit yesterday was all this creation language. You know, and so even in the beginning when it starts off in the beginning was the word, if we compare that to Genesis, God spoke creation into being. And so there's this thematic link between the logos, a word, and the act of creation speaking at all. But in um, verse 14, when it says, um, and the word dwelt among us. And again, I'm not a Greek scholar. I am like looking at a Greek text right now. Um, and I cheated and looked up a commentary. Mm -hmm. um, but the word dwell is derived from the word tent. And so you still have this, this language that relates back to the tent of meeting in the Old Testament where the glory, the kind of glory of God dwelt amongst everybody. 
and so you have like this this very vivid in imagery of you know god physically dwelling in human form amongst us in it in this fleshly tent and before i wrap it up just kind of like mentioning to jacob um he talks about like if you don't get the first verse right maybe the whole thing doesn't seem right um, all of these themes recur again and again and again so he kind of introduces this big thing in the prologue in john one and then whether we're talking about grace and truth or light and darkness, all of these things, you just they keep coming back again and again. Um, and then a final thing I notice is sometimes we talk about God um, with what's called apophatic language. Like we can't talk about God's divine attributes. We have to say what he is not. But in the gospel of John, kind of like the opposite is taking place where we get to have positive descriptions of Jesus as the physical manifestation of the Godhead in some sense. And so that's all of that is like stuff that with this close reading, I want to thank you for this group because I didn't, this is the first time I've done like a really close reading, just spending time alone with the text. Well, uh, thank you, Gary. And, uh, you know, it's wonderful to have you here. Um, and I, I really like, uh, you know, all your comments, especially the, the last one that, the way in which this is described and that I think that's what gives this gospel of John its intensity. Um, it is far more direct um, in, in naming things. Um, next up is going to be Evanique followed by Dave uh, and Dave. Evanique. Yeah, so one thing I noticed about um, the whole chapter, but in particular verse 14, is that John the writer or the supposed writer it takes this futuristic tone. Um, it's kind of like coming attractions. And when he's talking about uh, Christ coming and dwelling among us, it has kind of like two different meanings. If you read the whole text, it's, if you read, when you read the whole book, it, it's talking about Jesus coming in the flesh and being born of Mary, but it's also talking about the Holy Spirit that's gonna come down and dwell once Jesus leaves the earth at the resurrection. So I think there's a coming attraction. Um, I think the emphasis on John the Baptist announcing Jesus is a coming attraction. And you know how he announces this is the one that's going to baptize by the Holy Spirit. And he's going to have the spirit come down and dwell. And this whole thing about God coming down and dwelling among us. Um, I thought what was interesting was what Jacob said on, about the first verse, uh, where he talks about was a, like some translations read it, was God, and then others read it was a God. And I thought about that, and I think it goes to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, three in one, but they're three separate beings. And so there's God the Father, that's a God, God the Son, that's a God and God, the Holy Spirit, that's also a God. So the question then becomes, which God is it referring to? And the word was a God. And so the word can be interpreted as that's Jesus and that's a God. And the word was a God. Now, a God, I think could be the Holy Spirit because that's what comes after Jesus. It's kind of like in succession. That's just my own theory. Um, so I think it could be the Holy Spirit coming down. So, and another thing, like going back to the Jordan Peterson series, where it talks about masculinity and order and femininity and, or feminine, sorry, and chaos. And I always, that part, um, first of all, it always just, it, it always, as I always have to ask, like, where's the mother in all this? Or where's the feminine? and all of this. And if the feminine is the world and darkness as God created, as God spoke it in Genesis, if you go back to Genesis, God spoke, then the feminine is like the earth, which is like a womb, which is like the woman. I always wondered why the Bible emphasized the masculine bringing order and not the feminine as if somehow the feminine is weaker because to me it's equal parts. It's kind of like how you make a child. Both parts are needed to make the child. So I always wondered 
why. So I, I guess that's just a question I'm putting out there too for people to think about. But that's my first thoughts. Wonderful. Um, folks, uh, during this first round, we are getting our first thoughts on the table. We would have plenty of opportunity of going and revisiting uh, you know, all of this. And I think uh, Jacob is right. Um, we should go, you know, once we have done with our thoughts on this entire section, we can go back to the first paragraph. Um, next up is going to be Dave, Shekem, Becky, Claudio, Pegor, and Gary. Dave. Thank you, Shikant. And I apologize, I couldn't be here last week. But it's my understanding we are trying to help people understand Christianity that may not be familiar with it. And it sounds like this. Dave, uh, Dave, Dave uh, let, let me just clarify. There are people here. I, I am the person who knows Christianity the le least. Yeah. Uh, but there are people here who know Christianity a lot. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to put forth our own understanding of the text. That's what we are doing. We are trying to express our own understanding of this text. Well, what I wanted to say is, in this verse, John, who preceded Jesus, was baptizing people and was somewhat well-known, says, this is the Lamb of God introducing people to Jesus. And I wanted to give just a little background of why Jesus was not already known. If I could, please. He, he was born... And his mother was informed by angels that this, his, her son would be special. But the other instance that I am aware of is I think he went to the temple about age 10 or 12 and, and talked to the priests with unusual knowledge. But other than that, he was just a normal person. So this was, a, I believe, about age 30 that he started his ministry. And so this was his introduction to the world. And I think the verses fall in this, that he starts gathering disciples to be with them. But I just wanted to give just a little background because uh, in this particular um, uh, part of this or description of the story, um, it doesn't say that much about his birth. Anyway, thank you very much, Shakal. Thank you, Dave. Uh, next up is a shake him followed by Becky. Shake him. Hey guys, uh, it's Shaquem. Shaquem. Um, yep. So I really appreciate the way Evanique and Gary uh, described the uh, first verses of um, John as a prologue, uh, as common attractions. That's the way I've always looked at it. Um, and this is why I put so much more focus on the words in red, uh, Jesus's words, or at least what they say, you know, the, the recording of Jesus's words, uh, over what people say about Jesus. Because it is just that, it's a prologue, it's a commentary, um, a common attraction that's narrated from John's understanding, but not necessarily, at least from, from how I read it, not necessarily from the ultimate understanding. Uh, sometimes it seems like Jesus's words differ, uh, contradict the words about Jesus. And, um, and so I put a, a great emphasis on the words of Christ over what people wrote about Christ. I see it just like that. It's a, it's a common attraction, it's a narrative uh, from John. Uh, thank you, uh, Shaquem. Uh, next up is Becky followed by Claudio, Gary, and Pegor. Becky. Okay. Uh, so the truth was there in the beginning and uh, in Genesis, God spoke the world into existence. And so all things were made through him and out of the truth came reality. Uh, well, comes reality. And from that externalization, it's like what you were saying the other day, um, Shrikant, that you can interact with, with something that's been externalized. And, um, but 
uh, animals and humans can both do that. What differentiates man from animals though would be uh, consciousness. And um, what, we, what we end up perceiving determines what we know. And, um, and here it says, uh, he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. Um, and, and it's, it's, um, it's, it's that step beyond that interaction um, that requires that like openness uh, and, and that, in, that, that interpretation to actually know him. And, um, and the necessity of, of, of uh, Jesus to become flesh is also that externalization so that the world can have that ability to know him. Um, and then so said, no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the father's side. Um, he has made him know uh, through, through the word becoming flesh. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. Uh, next up is Claudio followed by Gary, Pegor, and Mike. Claudio. Oh, thank you. Yes, uh, uh, verse 15, the, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Uh, I see three things, although there is probably a lot more in here. I see, uh, uh, first of all, uh, accessibility makes himself accessible. Humility and uh, sacrifice, of course, that's the main purpose. So he goes from tra being transcended to becoming imminent in the world. Uh, when he's transcended, he's inaccessible, mysterious, very difficult to communicate with. But when he makes himself uh, into flesh, uh, he manifests himself into flesh, he becomes more knowable. You can have established a direct communication with him, right? Uh, so because he, he's one of them, one of the people. At the same time, there's humility uh, because he's kind of uh, sacrificing his uh, impermanence to become something uh, no, his permanence to become something impermanent in the flesh. He's becoming, uh, he makes himself vulnerable to uh, disease, hunger, thirst, you know, all, all the human condition. And uh, so he's being, uh, he's demonstrating humility in that way and kind of like uh, sacrifice, right? And uh, of course, the main purpose of his manifesting himself in the flesh is to become a, a sacrificial lamb or the sacrificial lamb uh, for uh, humanity. Uh, like Becky said, he makes himself more noble when he becomes in the flesh. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Claudio. Uh, next up is Gary, Pegor, and Mike. Gary. Uh, two things that, that come up is, uh, first off, the Greek doesn't have an indefinite article. There is no A. It's, it's the, where there's just zero, there's no article whatsoever. And so we, I think we can get lost in the woods trying to figure out if in English we want to insert the, the word A or something. Uh, but what's kind of more important is the imagery that John uses, you know, comparatively when we talk about, you know, what is Jesus, that he's being very, very descriptive in here. Um, I also like, back to like the idea of just what we were doing is, is John doesn't expect we're all Greek scholars, <laughs> yeah, he's, these are people from all over the world uh, who are going to go back to their native lands where Greek is probably not their native language. You know, maybe they know Greek because they have to be in Jerusalem and to be part of the temple or, or you know, whatever the region is with the Roman world. Um, and so it's, it's really a very vivid impression that's transcultural. He's really trying to push this out. That's transcultural and very cosmopolitan. I think it was a word that was used last week when I watched the, um, the recording. Um, and so, yeah, getting our initial impressions, I think, is just exactly what John is looking for. Uh, but more to the point is actually to discuss um, something Evanique brought up about the male and female, the gender and stuff, is that um, the gospel's depiction of Jesus is pretty consistently a gender bender, is that we use these masculine attributes of God, because that's what Jews, you know, that's the Jewish religion is very masculine. There's the dominant culture of the day. 
But then the descriptors, we see it already in like verse 18, when it talks about being in the bosom of the father. Um, even when we talk about the act of creation, we have these very feminine attributes that are being attributed to God while using a male, you know, male technically gender, and it is an inflected language. And so we're always referring to Jesus and God as male. But you'll see stuff that you, you wouldn't expect if he is divine and the master of the universe, you would expect all this male imagery of him having strength and power and dominance. But again and again, we have these proclamations of, you know, this, this superiority and this power followed up immediately by these very feminine attributes. And the one that sticks out most, we're not there yet, is John 13, where it says that all this power has been given to him and Jesus understands his whole identity and what's going on. And so then he just gets on his knees and starts washing his feet, the feet of his disciples, which parallels to him having his feet washed by a woman just previously. And so there's, there's this stuff going on is um, the, the feminine attributes of God, in summary, are not absent here. And actually, they're, they're kind of dominant. It would probably be standing out to people who are expecting um, Jesus to assume a more masculine role. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And that's a very interesting observation, the difference in the tone between the Old Testament and the New, New Testament, which is uh, all pervading. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Pegor, followed by Mike. And then we will go ahead and read uh, just the first paragraph and uh, talk about that. Um, Pegor, go ahead. Yeah, so I don't know if this is the right time, but I wanted to address the the question about the feminine or the lack of the feminine. Please do. Go ahead. Yeah, so it is, as Avinik pointed out, there is a sort of, you could say, a lack of representation, if you want, of the feminine. But that's because, as Avinik pointed out, there, like you have this duality in the Bible, which is you have the heaven and the earth, uh, male, female, masculine, feminine, that which is above, that which is below. And as even in Peterson uh, talks about, the feminine is always the like the the womb the 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 thing that represents potential and so if we're going to go with the heaven and the heaven and earth metaphor the feminine is included in the earth and the masculine is included in the heaven part and the point of the story is that when god creates adam it's like a joining of heaven and earth and so you cannot have one you cannot have being let's say or creation without without with one missing and so we when we say heaven and earth i understand that in in like our modern culture we have this sort of notion that somehow earth is less than heaven that somehow earth is tainted or polluted because we associate it with the material world that uh, mo that modernity uh, ha uh, uses but earth does not mean the material world it just simply represents potential and so the idea is that it's like it's like having a seed and a field you can't plant the seed if you don't have the field but neither the seed is better than the field nor the field is better than the seed they're completely different thing things the seed contains the idea of the tree or the idea of the plant and then but you can only have the plant when you put the seed in the field and let it grow and so that's the duality that's where you have the feminine and the masculine and you you can think of it the same way with with the in the story of john with not specifically the story of john but like in the story of jesus where you have mary a womb and then god sort of plants his seed in her and then if there's no mary there's no jesus in, in some in like biologically or whatever you want to, in, in the chain of causality let's say if mary doesn't exist if the womb isn't there to host the body of God, then God doesn't incarnate into, into this world. And so, and I've talked about this before, the feminine is the frame within which the masculine operates. It's the, it's the field in which the seed is planted. And so in that sense, the seed, can, you can think of the seed as the masculine and the field as the feminine. And so that's, and so it's much harder to sort of say, to tell a, sto a narrative story about the field that goes and does something because the field is more of like a matrix, like a grid in, uh, on which or in which things happen. And so uh, from a narrative perspective, it's, the, it's, like, uh, it's like the city in which the story happens. It's the village in which the story happens. It's the house in which the story happens. And so we, we tend to forget that. And 
our culture, especially our modern culture, is so focused on the masculine. It's so focused on the hero that you forget that there's a whole matrix of reality around that hero that's pointing him, that's directing him in a specific direction. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Begor. Um, so let's go back uh, to the first paragraph. Um, Jacob, would you like to read a couple of versions? You talked about uh, different versions. If you could just put a couple of versions on the table, and then we will open it up for anybody who wants to talk about the first paragraph. Go ahead, Jacob. Okay. Well, the, the, the translation I have in front of me is the Byington translation, and it, and it reads as it reads the same as most mainstream translations do as like NIV and so forth. So I can I know that the New World translation reads this way just from memory. Um, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was a God. And I think I know at least the Moffat and the Rotherham translations read the same. Um, can I make a quick comment on 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 the matter? Sure. Go ahead. Um, so I'm going to try to be hyper pinpoint about it because you know a discussion of John one one can just fragment into a million different places in all good places. <laughs> so and I don't love having to go to the Greek because it's it is unwieldy and and most of the time not necessary. But there's a time for everything under the sun, right? So there's a time for the Greek and John one one is a time for it. If there's any time, even if you're like a, no a novice, if you're just examining the scriptures first of all. John 1, 1 is actually a verse that you, I would say you're obliged to examine uh, grammatically. And that, that's like a, such an obstacle, but because it's so critical. And so I'm going to try to distill, and this is like 24 years of thinking about John 1, 1. And I'll just tell you what I've come to. Please take your time, uh, Jacob. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So I forget who was saying that it's, there's no, there's no definite, there's no indefinite article in Greek. So when there's this grammatical situation like that, they call so the word theos there um, is an anarthrous noun in Greek. So in other words, it has no indefinite article. So what that basically means is this, and I'm not, I'm not gonna provide any proofs here because we don't have time, I'm just gonna tell you stuff, <laughs> mm -hmm. is that both translations are, are, are accurate. You could put the word was God and the word was a God and they'd both be right. And here's, here's an example of why that's true. Well, you could go to the King James Version and go somewhere in Acts, I think Acts 28, where Paul has the snake on his hand and he throws the snake back into the fire and all that. Uh, well, it says in the, in the King James, you have the exact same grammatical situations as you in, in John 1, 1 there in Acts 28. And it says a snake. So the translators of the King James put an A there, but not here. Now they're not, they're not being tricky or, or deceptive necessarily. It's because when you're translating John 1, 1, it's up to the translator. What what are you already inclined to believe that Jesus is God or that He's not God? And so, so if you're if you're looking at John one one, it's really important to know this that it, both translations are right. So it's up to you, the reader, to decide in your comprehensive intake of the rest of the Bible how that should be translated. So it's not so easy because the problem now is that most translations just say the word was God. People don't know about the a problem, and so they automatically well Jesus is God, and they just go from there, and it's like. No, you got to get the foundation solid there before you just move on because, well, you can see how that would mess you up, right? Um, so like, I, I think that's about it. If, if you're curious to know, I believe that it should read a God because the Trinity is just doesn't seem to be apparent to me anywhere in the scriptures. So to me, the context of the Bible itself demands it to read a God. And that actually clears up a lot in the rest of John 1, you know, when it says um, that no one has seen God at any time except the one who explained him. Well, that makes, if, if Jesus is God, well, people saw him, but if he was a God, a son who explained God, well, he was seen and that would be okay. So that's just an example of how much gets cleared up. If you just, you know, dare mm -hmm. I say it, but obviate the whole Trinity idea. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Jacob. And thank you for bringing the attention back to John 1.1. 1, 1. Um, Next up is going to be David, followed by Gary. Folks, if you have comments about John 1-1, one, one, go ahead and type an exclamation mark or raise your hand in Zoom. David. Yeah, um, you know, the point he brings out about a God, uh, the previous word that I have, I go by the um, 
uh, authorized King James Version. And I do that mainly because of the fact of Strong's Concordance. What it does, it matches every single word of the Bible up to its original Greek and Hebrew meaning. Now, the thing is, I also have a problem with the word was in there too, because the, the reality of it is to me, I look at God, um, number one, the word Lord, in, when it's used in the Old Testament, actually means Jehovah, which becomes translated existing. So, and the thing is, when you're referencing the living God, okay, the thing is, when you use the word was, it's a past tense word, where to me, it should be is God, period. Because when, according to uh, the chapter that I was reading from earlier, uh, John 14, okay, when a word comes into a person's life and it becomes real, um, the thing is, it is real. It, it is living. It is a part of your life. And this not only happens with uh, words from God, but from the ideology of Jesus Christ, but it happens to us in everyday life, too, when we learn something new. You know, first we have questions and we accept the knowledge that it's there, but then all of a sudden, like if we're working on code, everything comes to light and all of a sudden we see the big picture. I mean, then that there becomes living inside of our flesh and it becomes something not of a past tense situation or a focal point, but it becomes something that is, is living and existing in our lives. And to me, that's the way I look at the words of Jesus Christ. And I just love so much the things that he says because he self-defines. And when he self-defines, it really gives a true picture of who God really is, you know, so. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, David. Next up is Gary, Cheryl, and Joe. Gary. I, I'm actually going to gonna pass because I'm staring. I uh, posted a link just to kind of let you know is that you can look at parallel translations. And so it's a quick link. If you want to look at it, you can compare what they are. And one of the translations they have is the um, uh, Society of Biblical Literature's um, Greek text. So you can actually look at it and compare it. Um, and so just, just that's just an out there. Is At this point, if I were to comment, it would be more about the Greek text. And I think that's too much <laughs> for, for this level right now. So uh, let me ask a question to anybody. Um, does anybody read Greek? So uh, Gary, you read a little bit of Greek, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, if anybody else reads Greek, uh, just let us know, uh, because I think that's uh, whenever I'm reading something like this, I always wish that I knew the original language because otherwise you're looking at it through so many levels of interpretation. Um, okay, uh, thank you. Next up is Cheryl, followed by Joe. Cheryl. Um, yeah, I, I'm looking at um, the, the, the um, descriptions, another description of the word word that's um, in this uh, conflict, con what is it called? A, um, the application that you guys mentioned, the, con the confluence where they give you the different words. Uh, uh, concordance. Um, Concordance, yeah. So I looked that up because I didn't know what um, word meant. And it had a translation of matter as it relates to speaking of a thing. And when I think about that, and I think about in the beginning, there was matter. And well, if we were all part of it, and, and it included all of us, um, it's a way of thinking as, as the universe and, and all of matter being everything, and then speaking a single thing into existence. Um, so it just makes me think that it doesn't really matter if matter was God or if it was singular or plural um, because it's all inclusive anyway. It's matter, it's everything. It's all gods, all of us because we have to think the whole universe existed before we started breaking rocks and dividing light from darkness and um, Anyway, that's just my thinking in, in a more universal text. Uh, thank universal. you, Cheryl. Uh, thank you, Cheryl. Next up is Joe. Um, and I, I kind of brought this up last time is the idea the word was God um, and the word uh, was made flesh. Uh, and the significance of that, so then what is what is the what is it displacing in that particular instance 
So then it's displacing things like nature as God, you know, so that other things that could, you know, that may have represented God prior to that, it's becoming man. And then, then what happens out of that? Um, it's, uh, you know, man is able to be sacrificed. Um, he's able, his actions are then, you know, uh, seen as, as kind of, um, you, you can enter into a covenant with God. Um, and you have this idea of free will that starts to enter into the equation because God is man. So that, that this is also, it's kind of unseating every other idea of God in, in the, in the process of God of nature, whatever, a God of certain, like, um, like polytheism that might have existed, you know, or did exist during Greek times. So that this is the one and only true God. And it's almost, uh, it's not an introduction to monotheism, but it's, it, it makes monotheism real. And that's a very important point because of what that actually represents for human beings going forward. That's just something I thought. Thank you, Joe. Next up is Evanique. Yeah, something Cheryl brought up actually, uh, just uh, right off of my brain. Uh, when Cheryl was talking about that the earth was here already, that the earth existed before the word or matter or God like made the trees. Um, I thought of the Wiccan religion or, you know, um, Native American religion and they feel like the earth is very feminine. And in some cases uh, they put an emphasis on the mother on mother earth and they either call it earth mother or other mother earth or, or something like that. And I just thought that was uh, interesting so I was thinking if God the Father is the word or order and the earth is mother, those two coming together would make Christ in a sense. And even though Christ came and was born of a woman, I think it, it's a very good point that he originated on earth through a feminine, a feminine woman like a female okay i'm gonna get that out right that he came to earth through a woman basically so i just thought that that was interesting and uh what gary said about uh earlier about um about jesus having very feminine qualities now it makes sense because if the earth is if the earth is the mother and god is the father if you're looking at it that way then yeah, it makes sense that Jesus has feminine and masculine qualities and that he's the epitome of both, which is why he is the human in the flesh because human is a male or human is a female. So just makes just something that, some thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Evanik. Next up is uh, Baron, uh, Jacob and Pegor. Baron, go ahead. Yeah, so when thinking about John chapter one, I just really see how um, like Christ is like the most like superlative, superlative and like final and definite like revealer of who God is um, talking about him as in him there is life in, and light and he is the true light to, um, and you know the law was given through Moses grace and truth came through Jesus Christ how on um, this kind of full revelation of who God is is only found in Christ. And I feel like understanding this go, um, makes me think of, I think it's John 14, where Jesus talks about um, how he um, wants um, us, um, he, he wants those who know him to see the glory that he had with the father before the world existed. So Christ, Moses um, speaks as one who um, had some knowledge of God, but Christ is the one who is with God from the beginning and who, I, um, it says, you know, all things are made through him. He is both with God and and is God. It's this relational 
glory that he had with the father from eternity past that I think um, that kind of relational nature within God, I think is um, key. And I think that all the superlatives put on Christ and the worship he receives and such cannot be really um, understood without that. And I guess, um, yeah, I, and yeah, I just, I just think John chapter one's really beautiful, but I think that an understanding John one, one, I think that seeing this in the context of Jewish monotheism is, is really important to kind of appreciate what's going on here. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Baron. Next up is Jacob followed by Pegor. Jacob. Thank you. Uh, this is sort of fun to do, especially, well, if you have kids or if you don't, you know, um, at the first, the word, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. So we're saying the word is Christ. I think we're pretty much in agreement on that for the most part. So there you have Christ with God and you might ask your kid, what's he doing with them? What are they doing? They're just sitting there. And then you can go to Proverbs 8. This is so it's gorgeous. You go to Proverbs 8 and it's wisdom personified. So it's wisdom talking. And, you know, through the centuries, many have agreed that this is speaking of this is Christ as wisdom personified. And it's kind of the answer to well, what was he doing when he was with God? And, and how it opens, you know, how it opens is I he produced me as the beginning of his way. And so that's saying, well, Christ then, if we're going to go with this, that Proverbs 8 is indeed referring to Christ, well, then he was produced. He was, he's a creation himself. It means he has a beginning. Um, and, and then, so it's beautiful to get to the end of Proverbs 8. And he, and he says, he, he's describing things like, I saw the mountains being born and before the dust particles were, before the deeps of the abyss were, were opened, you know, these like enormous concepts and he's laying them out like, you know, I saw all this stuff. And then at the end he goes, however, however, what I was fond of were the sons of men. So you have this character who, who's the beginning of God's creation, has all this authority and he's with him and they have a relationship and he loves people more than any of all that stuff. And then you, well, then you see Christ act that out when he comes to earth, he loved humans and he died for people. So it make it, so there's all sorts of points for Proverbs eight makes sense as not as speaking of the word. And it's why it's wisdom is beautiful because it's not just, Christ isn't just the word, but he's the word of wisdom, right? Because it's, it's words of wisdom and truth that are productive, not just any old words, you know, like lies are, aren't productive. So it's not just the word, it's the truthful word. It's the word of wisdom. Um, so it's not a stretch at all. And it really helps, again, it, it helps clear up this point of, well, was Jesus God himself or his son? Well, if he has a beginning, I'm sorry, if he has a beginning, oh boy, they're fundamentally different individuals, right? So yeah, Proverbs 8, it's good for the kids. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jacob. Uh, excellent. Uh, next up is Pegor. Yeah, so I wanted to sort of add to Evanik's point that Jesus has feminine qualities as well. And I would argue that's the case because Jesus is the person or the entity that unites opposites. So Jesus, it says like, I'm the beginning and the end. Jesus is both life and death. He, 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 he unites, sort of, he, he, he conquers death. So he's, he's, this, he's all of these sets of opposites that sort of converge or are resolved in him. And so like he is the king, but yet he is he is like the victim, you know, he is he is the leader, yet he he follows. Like you have these all of these opposites that sort of appear to somehow in sort of almost defiance of logic unite in him and sort of resolve their op opposition in him. And that's why you, you see him he is both in some sense masculine and feminine. And so that's because he is sort of everything much like god he is everything and so you see this these opposites uniting in him so he, he's alive and dead and then he sort of conquers death and so that's the play that i think is going on with that part of the with, with that with, with what was being talked wonderful that that was beautiful thank you uh thank you pegor uh now let's move on to the testimony of the of john the baptist this is number 19 through 28 if you would like to read it, go ahead and type an exclamation mark. Uh, before you start reading it, just say which version you're reading from. Let's have maybe two or three different readings. 
and we'll go from there. Type an exclamation mark if you would like to read. Joe, go ahead. Um, okay, from John the Baptist denies being Christ. Uh, yeah, 19 through 28. Well, what version are you reading? Uh, the NIV. Okay. So now this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fall to confess but confessed freely, I am not the Christ. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you a prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who, who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in words of Isaiah, the prophet, I am not the voice of, of one calling in the desert. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now, some of the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him. Why then do you baptize if you are not the, the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize water, John replied. But among you stands one of you. Do not, do not know. He is, he is the one who comes after me. The th the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This, this all, all happened at Bethany on the order side of the Jordan when John was baptizing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joe. Um, Evanik, would you like to read uh, your translation? Sure. Um, let me scroll back up. So we're starting with John announcing. That's right. From 19 through 28. So it will be okay. Evanique, uh, followed by uh, David Norton. Evanique, go ahead. Okay. So now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely. I am not the Messiah. They asked him, who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you a prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. Who, what do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of the one in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him. Why then do you baptize if you are not, not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one whom, I'm sorry, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. Thank you, Evanique. Next up is David, followed by Andrew. David. Okay, I got the uh, authorized King James Version here that I'll be reading from, uh, beginning verse 19. And this is the record of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, no. Then said they unto him, who art thou? That we may give an answer to them that sent us. What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord as said the prophet Isaiah, which is Elijah. And they which uh, were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him and said unto him, why baptizest thou then if thou be not the Christ nor Elijah, neither that prophet? John answered 
John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom, you whom ye know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it, I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Bethabara beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. Thank you, David. We will have one more reading of the translation, and then uh, everybody is welcome to give their thoughts on these verses. Next up is Enro. Enro, you need to... Yes, uh, right. Uh, I'm reading from the NKJV. Um, and now this is the testimony of John. And the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you? That we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now, those who were sent were from the Pharisees. And they asked him, saying, why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who, coming after me, is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. These things were done in Beth, uh, Bethabara, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. Thank you, uh, Andrew. Now, folks, uh, if you'd like to comment on this, please go ahead and type exclamation mark or raise your hand in Zoom. Next up is Gary, followed by David. Gary. Uh, thank you. Um, first, I wanted to note that um, I think it was Kevin posted a link up above if, in, in the chat if anybody wanted to look at it, which is a Greek interlinear. So it actually shows you how to pronounce the Greek words, has the Greek text, and then has the English translation underneath it. So if you don't know Greek, it kind of gives you like an, an you know, access to it if, you, if that's something you're interested in. I wanted to say thank you, Kevin, for that. Um, a couple of things. I was actually looking at Jason's question about the nature of humanity. And um, I'm thinking again about that apophatic concept and the positive attributes of Jesus all the way leading up to it and how when it describes him as having grace and truth and light and all these things, there's this clear implication that those are things that are in dearth in the cosmos. And that's the word that it used for the world. The cosmos is lacking those things. And so we're setting up the stage, even in the ministry of John the Baptist, um, when he says he's not the prophet and he's not anything. Um, there's still this understanding. Everybody's going to him. They realize that they have a need. Maybe they don't know what that need is, but it's really there's this, something, this innate human acknowledgement that, uh, that we're searching for some sort of redeemer or redemption or that there's something coming on that we maybe are ourselves incapable of providing ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Uh, next up is uh, David, Jacob, and Evanik. David. Yeah, I, you know, I, I sort of go along with what he just said there to a point. You know, the thing is, I believe that uh, John the Baptist is, is symbolic to all of us in our relationship with Jesus Christ, because we all have to be introduced somehow uh, to this ideology, you might say. And the thing is, uh, I recall that in Matthew, it talks about Jesus. I, I don't know if it's mentioned here in John or not, how he went to John and asked him, he was to be baptized by him. And then when he came up out of the water, the thing is all of a sudden there came that um, realization of that relationship with him and God. And Jesus in experiencing that, uh, John is the vessel, you know, that creates that sort of thing to happen. 
Uh, but the thing is, nowadays in our lives, it's, you know, John is not that living, but is representative of that. And I believe, this is just my opinion, that it happens, you know, through different people that we may know that bring in these ideologies to wanting to know more about what we're all about and where our life was formed and the bad things in our lives and all these things that are representative of Jesus, because just in his name, Jesus means saved of God. And they're talking about the living God when these words and these realities come to life within a person. And I think that my opinion is that John is very instrumental in it as a parable to what has to happen in a person's life in order to create that introduction to Jesus Christ. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, next up is Jacob, Evanique, and Joe. Jacob. Hey, <clears throat> I'll try to put this thought together. It's kind of on a, a light note or a humorous note uh, in, in verse, verse 21. Uh, he says, John says, I'm the, uh, the voice of one calling out in the wilderness, straighten out the Lord's road. So he came to prepare the way, basically, is the idea. And it's like, well, the natural question is, well, what do you, like, how do you prepare? And he, he got people in a mind frame, of, I, I suppose, penitence or repentance they need to be in when Christ arrived. But also, John was a freak. He, like he, you know, he ate locusts and he wore outlandish fur coats and dwelled out where, you know, he dwelled out in the wilderness. And if he came around, he probably, you know, he probably looked like a beast. So he was a hard guy to sort of swallow. Um, but what's cool about that was, well, Jesus was even harder to swallow. <laughs> Son of God, ideal, perfect man, like try to stand in front of that, right? So it was loving. You could say Jehovah sent, Jehovah sent the freak John to prepare people for like the super freak Jesus, you know, and not to be, I don't mean that disrespectfully. I mean that with all kinds of respect. Um, and it's sort of, so sort of like having the crowd listen to uh, Richard Pryor and then Eddie Murphy delirious, you know, it's like a nice thing to do for people. So that's kind of what he did with John. You know, he sent John to, to make Jesus a little easier to handle. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jacob. That, that was good. Uh, next up is Evanique followed by Joe. Evanique. First of all, I think Jacob was saying what I was going to say. But I have to say, Jacob, I've never thought of comparing John the Baptist and Jesus to Richard Pryor and Eddie Murphy. So that was good. Um, and it, it did, it, it wasn't disrespectful. I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, but I, I wanted to go to verse 26 where he talks about baptizing with water. I think he was um, designating people who were looking for, like who were genuinely looking for the truth, who were genuinely looking for a way of life or they were searching for God. And not, not, in, a, not in a way like the Pharisees, um, but in a true way, like looking for something in their heart, you know, um, just looking for like how to worship in a sense. And Jacob's absolutely 100%, that was perfect. Like John was a freak. Like most people, you would see him on the street today and you would probably run the other way. Like, this is how wild John was. He was like unkempt, probably smelled, no offense, but probably smelled. And he's probably telling you, I have the way. So I think you had to be looking to really listen to him and listen to his point. And that means you were looking for Jesus, even though you didn't know that that's who you were looking for. Like, and Jesus, the character of Jesus throughout all the scriptures looks for people who are seeking him. And they may not know who they are seeking, but they are seeking something and they are looking for something. And he's like, and he'll come up to them, like he'll appear to them. You know, it's very rare that they'll come up to Jesus. I mean, there's people that notice him who want to be healed, but for the most part, people see, G like when Jesus sees people, he knows that those are the people that are truly looking for him and looking for a change and looking something different in their lives. Like they almost need mercy. Like the Samaritan woman who had five husbands, she needed some type of guidance and Jesus was there. So I think definitely John was preparing and preparing with water to me is like baptism in the church today. Like you repent 
and then you're baptized. So it's kind of like you're turning from a way of life that you know is not working for you and you know doesn't ring true for you, but you're doing it just to survive or whatever. And then you're turning, but John calls you to turn your life around and prepare yourself for the coming of Jesus Christ. And he keeps talking about it. And it's crazy because even John doesn't know what this person looks like until he until Jesus appears. And then all of a sudden, John's like, yeah, that's him. You know, follow him. That's the guy. And so even John is looking for that truth. So I think for people who are attracted to John, they were attracted to something genuine and something true and something believable, and they were looking for a change. So those were my thoughts. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Evanique. Next up is Joe, followed by Cheryl and Baron. Joe. Yeah, it, it, it's kind of difficult to build on what has already been said, because I think that this is um, truly about uh, the desire for a Messiah at that particular moment in time. Uh, and that's what it represents. And so this idea that um, it's almost like we're looking for a hero. And, and, and this is essentially, John has set it up where there's a hero amongst these people. And that ended up being Christ. Um, so I think that the, in this particular instance, it's just nothing more than people in, in, at a desperate time uh, that are actually looking for God. Uh, to become man and save them one way or the other and actually bring to um, fruition some all the things, all the prophecies that have been written about God up until that point in time. So that, you know, we're, we're waiting for this one God to be sacrificed. We're waiting for this God to um, be our triumphant rede redeemer. And this is this is, you know, he's amongst us. So it kind of sets everything up and it puts everything into, and, and I, yeah, and I certainly don't mean any disrespect for anybody to anybody uh, by saying this, but it, that it, that's the context that I'm taking from it at, at this, you know, when I read this particular passage. Wonderful. Thank you, Joe. Uh, next up is Cheryl followed by Baron. Cheryl. Um, yeah, so a couple things about this passage, um, the idea that baptize means wash, and that um, they really essentially asked him, well, well why, why do you baptize if you're not the Messiah? And there was this underlying assumption that a Messiah would wash them. Um, it was because why would they ask the question? They, because that's what he was doing. And they're saying, well, that somehow makes you a Messiah because you're washing people. Uh, and also the idea that um, he was a voice calling in the wilderness, like he knew he needed, uh, he knew the Messiah was coming, but he uses the word calling, like I was calling in the wilderness. And we know that prior to, to him uh, meeting John the Baptist, that there was no record of Jesus for 18 years, but John the Baptist was calling him. And it wasn't until the two meet that, um, uh, that Jesus is recognized by God because, um, and anyway, the other part of it is the idea of making straight the way, that that idea of him being the one to steer God, like to steer Jesus and say, now this is where you go. You are to minister from this point. And, um, and, and the way that we all sort of like, um, when we have issues and we have problems in our own lives, and we need support and we need to be, um, and we need help with ways that we are what, however we are unclean because we've had, we've done, I don't wanna call it sin. You can call it sin if you want. Um, but the way we wash each other, you go to people with the same problems, help people with the same problems or, um, and that idea of washing each other. Um, and um, yeah, so I just wanted to just throw that out there. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Next up is Baron. Yeah, um, I always like whenever like something is quoted in the New Testament from the Old Testament to like look at it and um, get some context. I think um, 
it's easy for me to get excited. And I think with Street Count one time, I read like 14 chapters of Isaiah from this point, um, which was maybe a lot, but I'll just read a little bit um, of what John's quoting when he says, you know, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Um, and this is from Isaiah 40. Um, um, it reads, a voice cries, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Um, so I just find um, that passage just beautiful about, you know, the glory of the Lord being revealed. And this is like the culmination of how God's been revealing who he is and it's, it's, it's happening. Um, Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Baron. Um, I want to ask a question to everybody, you know, thanks to Leonardo da Vinci, I have some conception of John the Baptist because he's done two incredible paintings of John the Baptist. And we are talking about words here, but a great artist can actually communicate a lot through paintings. You know, I have spent hours in front of these two paintings, both of which are in the Louvre. One of which is, one is called John the Baptist. I've used that image in the first video. And the second one is called Madonna on the Rocks, which is a painting of four figures, Mary and Jesus, and John the Baptist and his mother. Um, so the question, is you know the, the heart of John the Baptist is that he's a harbinger. And the question is exactly how is he a harbinger? David made a beautiful point that in effect, we are John the Baptist in the sense that we can help others see the way. And to the extent to which we help people do that, point the way, we are being harbingers. There are two points that are interesting, that I find interesting. One is the ministries of John the Baptist and the ministry of Jesus. The ministry of John the Baptist is hap happening at the edge, in the wilderness, at the edge of the forest, edge of nature, not in the city. The ministry of Jesus moves to the heart of the city. So there is that difference between where the ministry is taking place. And second is the difference between being baptized with water, which is about repentance and being baptized with Holy Spirit. And what's the difference and how these two ministries, what is the relationship between these two, um, these two ministries, these two people, John the Baptist and uh, Jesus. So anybody who wants to comment on that, uh, Gary. Um, I think that's just amazing uh, what you notice. I just want to thank you so much for that. Um, I was actually thinking of something else when I poked my um, exclamation point, but you, you took the cake, you took it over. Um, that there, there's, um, I think in the gospel accounts, after Jesus' baptism, he immediately goes into the wilderness. And so there is that whole notion of the wilderness as a time of preparation. I also just really love the reading from Isaiah earlier because we're, we're back to it, is that the notion of what's taking place is that John is saying is that the king is coming. And when we make the straight, the straight path, we make the highway, we're actually welcoming him saying, we want the king to be here. And so, and this is the, the thought that was, that was, that kind of looms large is um, no matter who it is that's reading or hearing the gospel of John, uh, what looms large is the death and, and resurrection of Jesus already is everything that was written was wrote pos posthumously. And anybody that's exposed to the gospel is already there encountering the, the death and, and resurrected Jesus, even from the very beginning. Uh, there are no secrets necessarily. And so every word that we're looking at it when we're, when we're doing that in the background is the cross. Um, and so that's just something that kind of like pops in my head. So even 
you know, with that whole welcoming and the Holy Spirit, all of that is just really kind of its own commentary on the text as we encounter it. Thank you. thank you. Thank you, Gary. Uh, next up is Evanique followed by David. Evanique. Yeah, so I think with John, John is the announcer of Jesus. So it's kind of like when Jesus comes, John's part of the story is about to end. And John indicates that when he says, when he says to Jesus, basically, you are to become more and I am to become less. So it's it's all part of a design. Um, if you're going to talk about a divine design in that, um, John was to prepare the way for Jesus. Like John does the first part of the design, right? He prepares people. He gets people ready to hear the message of Jesus Christ. He gets, he tells people about who he, he knows this person to be. So he's kind of like the, the beginning stages. He's preparing the, the people for Jesus. And then when Jesus appears, Jesus kind of has to take it up. And it, uh, Gary brought up a very good point about Jesus having to go into the wilderness because Jesus has to prepare for this ministry. The first part is that John must baptize him first. Like John must baptize him with water. You know, the dove must come down from heaven and he must be consecrated to do his ministry. And then he has to go into the desert and, you know, and the Bible talks about he has to be tempted because we're all tempted as people. But it's also... Just like John had to be in the wilderness to prepare and become closer to God, so just Jesus. And like, if you're going into the wilderness, um, you have nobody to depend on really but God. So at that moment, Jesus has to depend on nobody but God. And then that means that Jesus prepares for the ministry. That means John goes away now. John's part of the story. John's part of the design is over. Jesus comes in. Jesus prepares people uh to receive grace to be baptized by the holy spirit and jesus also prepares people to live in to live a life of uh christ to live a proper life I, for lack of a better word a, a life that's sin not sinless because we're not sinless and he doesn't imply that we will ever be but that we are trying to live life like God wants us to live it or like God intended us to live it. In a sense, it's to reset what Adam and Eve did in the beginning, which was exposed us to sin in the beginning. He's there to make it right. Some people call Jesus the second Adam. He's there to make it right. So that's part of his design. So I think their relationship and the way it is, is that, you know, John comes in, Jesus comes out, they have their part of the story and so those are my thoughts. Wonderful. Thank you, Evanique. Uh, next up is David, followed by Jacob. David. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, the, John's baptism has become uh, traditional symbolism is what I call it now, because many people will go and, you know, you go to your church and then you get dunked underwater and it, and it becomes a symbol of belief. But then on top of that, I believe that there's uh, being baptized by the Holy Spirit is something that is totally different in that a person say in the relationship that john and jesus had there was uh was that relationship with god once again with uh john introducing jesus you know basically to that holy spirit that connection with god and um you know once again through jesus christ he he redoes all the commandments in matthew uh, uh chapters five through seven and the thing is, even he mentions, you know, in order for the Holy Spirit to come, you have to take and acknowledge the things that he speaks. And he speaks a whole lot more than these commandments that are all, all these things relate to a person's life, the way you live every single day of your life. And to me, when these things come to light in a person's life, this here is being baptized to me in the Holy Spirit. Because the thing is, a person's spirit actually becomes cleansed because you realize that what you've done in the past or the way that you've done it was wrong. You know, it's just like making a mistake and saying, oh my God, what, why did I do that for so long? You know, I mean, this is just a process and it's a natural process of life, whether we believe in Jesus or not, because 
you know, if we continue to make our same mistakes, then we have the same problems. So without fixing the mistakes, you know, we don't change. And, you know, Jesus Christ is all about the ideology of change and doing things to the better. That's the way I look at it. Thank you, David. Thank you. Uh, next up is Jacob followed by Cheryl. Jacob. <clears throat> yeah, I just had a thought while I was listening to everybody, which I, it's kind of, I guess that kind of means it's our thought, right? <laughs> uh, so, but also means it could be just wrong, but um, it, it is interesting how John's, John died like early on in Jesus' ministry. He died really abruptly and severely, right? He had his head chopped off. I, I can't imagine in a more abrupt, severe way of dying than, you know, the chop of the head. So there's like a, as Jesus rose or arrived, John was gone. There was a bit of an overlap, but you know, you see the point. And so the thought was, you know, could the world hold both of them? And that's not to put John at all on equal footing with Christ, because there's a world of difference. John was an imperfect man. Christ ascended from the heavens. Like chasm is great. However, Jesus himself said that John was the greatest man who ever lived. And that's, that include that, and that's taking into consideration Abraham and David. It's like, wow. And so John had this extraordinary ministry that was quite brief, and then never really like get never really got to be around for Jesus stuff. Um, so I'm sort of again, I'm just this thoughts coming out in real time here. Like, could the world hold both of them? You know, um, the thought is a question. <laughs> Wonderful. That, that's, it's a great question. Um, and we will come to it. Uh, you know, whenever anybody wants to pick it up, they are welcome to pick it up. Um, next up is Cheryl, and then we will read the, uh, the next paragraph. Uh, Cheryl, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to add, uh, I thought it was interesting that you brought up the artwork, because what I've noticed in studying um, these um, picture, the uh, depictions of Mary, God, Joseph, and Jesus is that um, the colors that they're usually wearing. And um, if you've ever been to the Sistine Chapel and you've seen the image of, of God and Adam, you notice that God is wearing pink. And um, they thought that was very, you know, it was pointed out to me by an Italian guide. Um, it's kind of laughing like, oh, God's wearing pink. Um, and um, Mary is usually depicted in light blue, like the color of the sky, the sort of ethereal um, from the sky. And Joseph is usually in brown of the earth. And um, Jesus is usually in red, um, more, even more bolden than pink, um, and, but a version of pink. And um, when we see the picture of John the Baptist, I just saw it a few weeks ago in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And he's, he's not wearing anything except a light blue um, sort of a cloak. Um, the depiction of the womanly figure of Mary as, her, as his role in bringing Jesus uh, into his ministry and into the world for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, next, we are going to read uh, the section on Behold the Lamb of God from 29 to 34. If you'd like to read, go ahead and type exclamation mark. Start by saying which translation you're reading from and which version you're reading from and go from there. Go ahead and type exclamation mark if you'd like to read. Evanique. Okay, so I am reading from the NIV. Uh, so the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me, but I'm oh, so sorry, surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave his testimony. I saw the spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the spirit coming down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Evanique. Next up is Joe followed by Baron. Joe. 
Uh, this is actually also the NIV. Um, so uh, would you like me to still read it? Or please, please. Yeah. Uh, the okay. thing is that what, what happens is that these readings are important. Um, okay. Multiple readings, multiple people's voice carrying their understanding of the text. I think it's a good, uh, good way to start. Go okay. ahead. Sounds great. Jesus, the Lamb of God. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. This is one. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did, did not know, did not know him. But the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave the testi this testimony. I saw the spirit come down from heaven and as a dove and remain on him. I would not, I would not have him know, I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize the, with water told me, the man on whom you see, see the spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is the son of God. Wonderful. Thank you, Joe. Next up is Baron. I'm reading from the ESV. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the son of God. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, David, could you read from the King James Version? You're on mute. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay. Um, we're starting at 29, is that it? The paragraph 29? Uh, we, yes, we are starting with 29 through 34. Okay. okay, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me, and I knew him not. But that he should be made manifest to Israel, therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy, Holy Ghost. And I saw and I bear record that this is the Son of God. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, David. Now, uh, anybody who would like to comment on these verses, go ahead and type by exclamation mark. We'll start with uh, Evanique, followed by David. Evanique? Yeah, uh, the first that really struck me where he talks about he, uh, Jesus and John, and John says, he was before me. And I think it, that's a very important part because this, is for the, especially for the followers or the disciples of John, this is John's way of saying he is the true deal. Like, this is the one I've been talking about. Like, this is the one we've been preparing for. And uh, just going back a little bit, when you were talking about Jesus's ministries in the city, if you think about it, people probably came from the city to the wilderness to check out John. Like people probably heard about John and, you know, wanted to study with John. So now these are the people, while Jesus is preparing himself in the desert, 
that's going back and saying, you know, John said, you know, he's seen this guy and this guy is Jesus. So there's already, in a sense, disciples who are uh, disciples of John who are also preparing the way for Jesus because John said this, because John said he was before me. That means he was the Messiah, that he is the Messiah, that he is the one that we've been waiting for. So those are my, my initial thoughts. Wonderful. Thank you, Evanik. Next up is David, followed by Jacob. David. Yeah, once again, I think I was talking about this a little bit earlier, but the thing is, um, I'd like to combine this together with Matthew because, you know, the the stories are very similar. The only thing is in the John story, he's not baptized in the water where the uh, Matthew story is Jesus is actually baptizes. And then, uh, the, you know, the, the spirit of God actually comes down to him at which, you know, everything changes for him. But the thing is, I think there's some symbolism that is included in this whole thing too, because when you go into the Old Testament and after Moses died, the first thing that happened is they crossed the Jordan River, okay? And after they cross the Jordan River, they go into Joshua, which is just another name for Jesus Christ. Okay, so I think there's that tie there that exists that, you know, sometimes needs to, these old things need to be examined too in their own, own right, you know. But um, anyway, the, the thing is, I think that there is just the beginning and the foundation, of not only of what happened to Jesus, but what has to happen with each individual and to me, this is a, because the thing is the word Jordan means to descend. I mean, and I look at that as having to be humble and the self-realization that, hey, that uh, we live in a, I live in a world that where I've made a lot of mistakes and I've been taught a lot of mistakes. And it's time for me to take and examine these mistakes. And, uh, you know, as even in Deuteronomy says that we need to place a, a teacher above us and there are a king above us that refers to, to take and guide us. To me, Jesus is that king. Thank you, David. Uh, does anybody else want to comment on these verses? Becky. I'll comment on uh, the reference of Lamb of God. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's... Um, it ties in with the whole um, baptism too, because it's like the baptism was more of uh, back in Leviticus. It's that that cleansing um, for for the for people when they were unclean. But you don't really cleanse yourself. You do it over and over. And same thing with um, like the Day of Atonement when you pay for your sins for the year. Uh, you slaughter a lamb and you do it year after year. And so here we're, um, we, we hear John talking about, well, here's the lamb of God. Um, you do it, uh, he, he's a sacrifice, but he's a sacrifice that, um, that lasts. It's not going to be repeated over and over. And same with being baptized um, in the Holy Spirit you're it's it's not the same as the water um of of cleansing um so it's like all these things are given to the people uh the jewish people so that they would recognize it when the 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 ultimate form came around um and so when when there is that uh baptism of the holy spirit it's um it's it's once because um, it it's uh, it it's it's a symbolism. Well, it, and and I guess um, for it's a symbolism that God is dwelling in you, and that only comes from um, from a like a regenerated heart because uh, we're talking about fallen man and um, and. How do you uh, uh, become new um, in in the spirit? Is going to be through um, through that regeneration, and so that now instead of like the Old Testament of of God dwelling in the tabernacle and the temple, man becomes the temple, um, and and it's pure 
and you have God dwelling in people. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. Um, I would like to pose a question uh, based on, uh, no, wait, wait a minute, uh, Joe, Joe, go ahead. I mean, I think that, I, and I'm just going to really just build off of what Becky just said a little bit, is that the idea of the Holy Spirit and the importance of God's like omnipresence, uh, that in, you can kind of see, I know that you can kind of see the Trinity kind of playing in here a little bit. I understand that, you know, what Jacob said a little bit earlier, but if God, the Father, you know, God, the Son, as far as just a, um, not necessarily, uh, you know, God, the Son, God, the Spirit, but you also start to see the idea that how these archetypes of like God, the Father, too, and how they all play into one another and how they each have their role and how these, these, we, we start to, to, and, and the idea that, um, uh, there's this redeeming quality to this man as well. Um, that, that I'll leave it there. That's actually a, just a, the redemption aspect of it and the idea of the Holy spirit and God becoming man and this idea of Trinity. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Next up is Cheryl. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add one other thing about the Holy Spirit and um, and the way it's described, because spirit, we can also think of as um, not only a soul, a person's soul, but as a current of air, like a breath, like a blast of air. Um, or breeze, like, you know, J Jesus, uh, God descends, and the Holy Spirit descends, like the breath of life, like life is breathed, that um, not only into Jesus, that, that he can now, he knows he needs to do his ministry, but it's, but even John the Baptist feels that they all felt the breath of life descend on them, and I think that's what the Holy Spirit is in all of us, it's our breath of life, it's our purpose, it's our um, it gives us air in the morning to, to fill our lungs so that we want to go out and um, be servants, because uh, that's what the Holy Spirit essentially does for us. It says that we want to serve others. We want to be servants, as Jesus was the example. And um, I think that's where it all uh, begins with breath. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, I want to follow up on an observation that uh, Jacob made, that um, you know, he recounted Jesus looking at all this creation and of all the creations, you know, that after mountains and everything, when it comes to human beings, that's when he is, you know, this is what I love. And the entire sequence of God sending his only son down, the, you know, Jesus sacrificing himself, for people. So there is this love of human beings that God, Jesus, have. So any, any thoughts on that? Uh, Jacob? Yeah, I love that you took it there. That's great. Great place to take it. Um, yeah, so there's this, well, <clears throat> Christ clear, clearly has a special love from, for humankind. But he's also fascinated because, well, if you just take 10 seconds and contemplate the person of Jesus, you have a, well, not an eternal being. Well, we can argue about whether he's eternal or not, but he's at least very ancient. <laughs> and, but then when he's on earth, there's a couple instances. It's very rare where it says that he marveled. And it was when some, I think one case it was, it was Cornelius. Uh, he marveled at his faith. So there you have Jesus, this ancient being who's like seen it all, and he's in, he's marveling. So it's, what that tells us is he's seeing something new. Because you don't marvel at that which you've seen. You marvel at that which you've not seen. And so he's, that, that tells us that there's something infinite about humans. And even Christ himself can gaze into that infinite space and marvel at it. Like, that's, such, that's an amazing idea, right? Um, I think that's where it stops. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. 
Uh, next up is Dave. Yeah, uh, the end of the story when Jesus loses his life, and it says here to forgive us of our sins. And they are saying this is this distinctive feature of Christianity that you know, everyone sins, everyone comes short of the mark, but in Christianity, we are forgiven and we're given another chance for redemption. So that's the uh, Christian story. Thank you. Uh, next up is Kevin. Kevin, go ahead. Okay, hi. Um, yeah, about the last thing, you, uh, if it's okay, I could just wanted to talk about what you had said before, but from, from the last thing, I think forgiveness is a uh, the key and probably just about the, impossible, the most impossible thing that we, we can do um, uh, to each other and to ourselves. I think it, it's hard, one of the hardest things that um, not many people can do. And, and yeah, that's pretty much the message at the end of, of, of everything. Um, but before that, I know you guys were talking about baptism and, uh, you know, I didn't realize the power of being baptized until I, uh, I was able to baptize my kids. And, um, you know, we have always believed in bad spirits, you know, demons and stuff like that. And, and that's what uh, I believe was the, the difference between being baptized and not being baptized, being in this circle of, uh, of being protected, you know, against once you baptize, you become part of this family of, of uh, good spirits, I guess you could say. Um, and uh, it creates a difference, you know, how kids, especially, or anybody that's baptized, see the world. It's, it, it's no, doubt, no doubt about that. Uh, but I think it's in the intention of how we do it that I think works, too. It's like, uh, to me, I've realized, I come to realize that holy water, it's, uh, uh, it's just a spell put on water, you know, words with an intention. Uh, it's like any other spell you could, like, I guess I can think of, good or bad. Uh, the, the power of words, it's, it's amazing. You know, if you talk about it from uh, the frequency to the vibration of, of, of even the humming or singing, you know, there's, there's a, a power that comes from us uh, with our intentions of, of the, the intentions of the energy that we uh, create. Just like cursing somebody out, it's a negative. Uh, and it's been proven uh, that it makes things die or come alive. So that's what I think about that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, next up is going to be Evanique, Becky, and Claudio. Evanique. Yeah, um, something Becky talked about uh, earlier when she was talking about um, Jesus, the, the spirit coming in us and dwelling in us. And um, I was thinking about that and I was thinking about all the cultures that talk about that, that God is within us and that um, in other religions, uh, we're divine creatures as well as humans. And I was thinking about that because Jesus is divine, 100% human and 100% divine. And so if we are like Jesus Christ, then we are also 100% human and 100% divine. And maybe Jesus was here to show us that and to show us how to live that way not necessarily how to live a sinless life. That's impossible. But what he came to show us is how to live. And you can see in his ministry, his ministry was a ministry of love. He loved people. And like, uh, I think it was Jacob said that he marveled at uh, certain human beings. And I think it, when he came, he came to teach us about how to love it ourselves and how to love each other. And um, he, especially when he talks about the golden rule, which I know is a little cliche, but it's like love others as you love yourself. But it's also very deep in that. And like, and so in Christianity today, not necessarily what Jesus taught, but in Christianity today, we're seeing, we're supposed to look at ourselves as these sinners, as we're bad, we're wrong, you know, Jesus has to come and baptize us and we still have to live by all these rules in order to be the good human being. And so we have to follow all these things and not sin and not do this and that, um, you know, just follow all these man-made rules. And so, but if Christ gave us the spirit to live like him in us and we love like him, Jesus said, we got it right. Like you don't have to follow all these rules. Uh, 
you follow the rules when you're living your life according to love. So I just thought that's what it brought up for me. And I thought that was just very interesting. Wonderful, uh, Evanique, thank you. Uh, let's go with uh, Claudio followed by Becky. Claudio. Yeah, thank you. Now, I was just thinking what Becky said earlier regarding the, uh, the rituals uh, from the Torah or she, uh, most people refer to it as the Old Testament. Uh, so they're, they've been doing those types of rituals, right? And remember in the, uh, in the Torah, God established an eternal covenant with the Jews, with Israel. It's unbreakable, right? And it's based on obedience and the rituals that Becky uh, referred to, alluded to, right? So then Jesus comes along uh, centuries later and introduces a kind of like a new system, right? Uh, which is uh, different, right? It's very, uh, it's revolutionary. Uh, but, and, and, and uh, it's revealed, so he comes, so it's revealed, the bap, uh, I, I came at baptizing with water, uh, was that he might be revealed to Israel, Jesus, but it's the Gentiles that buy into this new system of worship, uh, salvation, right? It's uh, not the Jews, uh, even today, we, like, they're not buying into it, so uh, it presents a kind of a dilemma. Uh, or is it possible that both systems can go coexist? Uh, you know, one from the Old Testament and the New Testament. So it's kind of confusing because um, something so paramount, so important that uh, many people just they they don't they don't accept it. They uh, they uh, they still abide by the um, by the rituals in the Torah, or you know the system, the the, the initial system, right? that was implemented. So I just think it's kind of confusing. Um, or... Thank you. Thank you, Claudio. Uh, next up is Becky. I really like your question because it ties back to Genesis and, um, and I see like this whole chapter is like so much of a reflection of um, or a parallel of Genesis, especially at the beginning. And um, so when, when God created man, and then the serpent in the garden deceived Eve um, and then came about original sin, uh, everyone there on was tainted by that, um, including them. But, um, but everyone born from flesh in, uh, inherited that. And so I see it as like, the flesh represents um, the mixture of Eve and, um, and the serpent. And so they're born, uh, I guess, as children of, of, um, of the serpent rather than children of God. And, um, and so in, in John 1, um, I guess, uh, verse 12, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And so it comes back to what the passage that we just read. How does that happen? Well, it comes through, um, through having this everlasting uh, sufficient sacrifice to pay for, um, for, for the, the tone, the the to atone for that original sin, um, that that then lets you um, have that spiritual rebirth, um, not so much obviously not the physical, but um, but it's a spiritual rebirth that um, that lets someone become um, a child of God. Um, as whereas like before everyone is like a product of Eve and, and the serpent. Wonderful, great. Thank you, thank you, Becky. That was wonderful. Next up is uh, Jason. Hello, uh, I have questions about Christianity and capitalism. No, 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 uh, uh, Jason, let's, uh, let's not go into that. Uh, okay. we, we, are, we are focusing mostly on the text. We will come oh, okay. to that, but we'll, maybe we'll come to that in maybe like seventh or eighth of these sessions. 
we will go ahead and uh, do that. But um, so um, I want to bring up one point that Pegor brought up. He called, I think he used the term, it's the second version of Adam. So there is Adam and Becky talked about, you know, the Garden of Eden. There is Adam and there is Jesus. What is the relationship between that, between these two? David. Look, I turned the thing on. I didn't know I was on already. <laughs> okay. Um, the, um, you know, I, just, I was just thinking about this. Um, the relationship number, to me, I, I use a go back and do the original definition of this whole thing. And when you go back and define things, because to me, the Bible is more about communication and language than anything else. And from the beginning, God gave Adam the instruction to name everything according to his kind. And even before that, the words that are used, I think, were created from, say, from Adam. Because the word Adam actually means mankind. It takes in men and women both. Okay. And the thing is, Adam was named because he fit the event of mankind, you know. And to me, like the comparison of him and Jesus uh, is very, very different because of the fact that, but there are similarities too, because the thing is, Adam was tempted through Eve by the serpent. And the thing is, Jesus was tempted by the devil in the desert. I mean, those are very, very compatible things in the respect of having two men being exposed to these different things. So in that way, they are alike. But the thing is that's different with Jesus, it has to go to the prophecy of Moses because Jesus says many times in, the, in his words that, hey, if you don't believe Moses, you can't believe me. So the foundation of Jesus is within Moses. And the part that is within Moses is the prophecy of Jesus Christ, where God is talking to Moses and he says, I'm going to raise up a prophet like you, and I'm going to put my words into his mouth. And whatever he says, you're going to, is going to be required of you. And the thing is, if you don't follow those things, okay, the judgment is you're going to be judged by the words that you say that may not be in relationship to what Jesus says. So in that respect, Jesus is very different than Adam, because before that time, before that time, the thing is, Adam was a person and vulnerable to all of the natural things that a man would do and also, you know, respond to. And you got to remember that I, at least I remember, is that the first four or five, five books, I guess it is, of the Old Testament was documented by Moses. Now, the thing is, because he was part of the uh, of Judaism or the Hebrew theology, I mean, he was compelled to write a lot of things down in there that may not have been true. A lot of these things in these law, okay? But the only thing is, you know that in Exodus, and, um, you know, basically in Exodus, I mean, he's recording the Exodus of, you know, the Jewish people out of, out of um, Egypt, you know, which means bondage too in itself. So the thing is, this whole story that begins in the Old Testament is really a part of the life of Jesus Christ and what his purpose was here on this earth. And it is noted several times, okay, like I say, if you don't believe Moses, you can't believe me. And very in the first chapter of uh, Matthew, it says that Jesus came, okay, to save the people from their sins. That's what the word Jesus actually meant, actually means, period, I should say. And the word Christ is a nothing more than another, well, there's a Greek interpretation for Messiah. They use Messiah in the Hebrew, they use Christ in the Greek. And the thing is, a lot of the Greek words get interchanged with some of the Hebrew words, you know, like Gehenna and, and uh, you know, Christ, which is Messiah. And unfortunately, our English language takes all these words and we have many synonyms that may describe one event in the Hebrew or in the uh, Greek itself. So without looking at all these different synonyms, it's really hard to get a true understanding of what's actually being said, so. Wonderful, thank you, thank you, David. Next up is Jacob, Gary, and Pegor. Jacob. 
So that's a, I keep saying this because it keeps on being true. Like that's another, it's a great question you ask, Shrikan, because it cuts right to the heart of the, of what the ransom is, um, right to the heart of it. So uh, what's the relationship between Adam and Jesus? Well, first of all, let's, what do the scriptures say explicitly? Will they explicitly call Jesus the last Adam? That's a phrase worth remembering, the last Adam. Well, well, and we can just think pretty superficially about how they relate. Well, through one man, all sin entered the world. So Adam sinned, all his offspring, through the principle of heredity, inherited sin. And then Christ himself buys back legally all that Christ lost, right? And that's why he's called eternal father. Like Adam would have been our eternal earthly father, right? But Jesus comes in like a heroic big brother and buys back what Adam lost. Here's the cool part about this. This is what's so cool about this. And this does actually gets right back to John. It links back to John 1, 1 and the Trinity issue. So in the Greek scriptures, uh, Christ's sacrifice gets called a propitiatory sacrifice or a covering sacrifice. So there's this idea of correspondence and you might think eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, equivalence. So Adam was a perfect man. He wasn't part God or anything, right? He was just, he was a man. Now Christ comes. Now the argument here, was Christ just a man? Was he, you know, obviously he had a, he had a pre-human existence in the heavens, but in his state on earth, was he somehow this hybrid God man or was he, well, he often said, I'm the son of man. He seemed to want to emphasize that fact as if he was anticipating the idea of, of as if he was anticipating the Trinity as it would come later and, and emphasizing the fact, look, I'm the son of man. I'm born of, of, a, of a human, it makes me a person. And why that's, why that's important is then you have the, that's the covering equivalent propitiatory sacrifice of Adam. And if you don't have that sort of equivalence and you have a God man paying the price for a regular man, what you have is cheating scales and Jehovah himself all over the place, especially in Proverbs says, I hate cheating scales. The weights have to met, have to even out. And I'm sorry, but a hybrid God, man and Adam, it doesn't even out. It's like Jehovah's cheating. So <laughs> how are Adam and Jesus linked? Well, Jesus is the last Adam. He bought back everything, uh, including you know, all of us. Wow. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, thank you. Uh, next up is Gary, Begor, Cheryl, and David. Gary. Um, yeah, I was going to say thank you, Jacob. That's uh, I like really like your use of imagery and just like you really just like you're obviously very passionate about all of this and and I I just love how you put it, pull everything together. Um, I actually was was relating it back to um, uh, what Ebenique had, had said earlier about love. And just like how when we get to like John 3.16, which is coming up, you know, you have for God so loved the world. And again, it's the cosmos of the entire world system is, is what's, what's being spoken of there. And so you have this, 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 what was lost in Adam and the creation in the fall. You have this juxtaposition, like we we're saying, this parallelism between the curse and the redemption. And so even before we've even started talking about the Christ and everything, and the cross and, and the resurrection is we just see this at the very beginning that all of this is laid up and is prefigured as this giant act of love. And so you have light in a world that is dark. You have truth in a world that was like that fell because of a lie. You know, that was the whole lie of the serpent and everything that was taking place there. You have grace um, juxtaposed against law, you know, and, and so again, it's, this, it's and again, like what Ebony said, is I think she, she really nailed it when um, when Jesus gives the golden rule, he's actually quoting Leviticus, you know, 1918. And there's a there's a rabbinical story that um, the rabbi Hillel was asked, you know, a proselyte said, you know, if you can tell me, explain all of the Torah while standing on one foot, then I'll become a convert. And so he quotes Leviticus 1918. He says, you know, that which is you know, onerous to yourself, do not do to anyone else. Up upon this, hang all the law and the prophets. Now go study it. The rest is detailed. And so you have Jesus like kind of quoting that same thing. But in John 13, he, he twists it a little bit. And he says, I need you to love one another the way that I loved you. And that's immediately after he got down on his knees and washed their feet. 
And so you have this, this whole notion of, of what does it mean to love is this concept of self-sacrifice. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's what I have. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Uh, next up is Begor, Cheryl, and David. Begor. Yeah, so for me, the relationship between Christ and Adam is that what happens is that when, when you have the fall happen, what that does is it makes death uh, a quote-unquote bad thing. It becomes a scandal. And so the, the purpose of Jesus' sacrifice is to glorify death. It is, it is an undoing of Adam's act, but not in the sense like you control Z undo on your computer as in you, re, you return to a previous state, but in the sense of transcending what was the, the error that has occurred. And that's why in, in Revelation or later on, we talked about the new Jerusalem and it's like a transcendence of death. And that's what Jesus effectively does. He, he dies, he goes into death and defeats death and then resurrects. And so there is a glorification. There is a, there is a flipping of death from something that is scandalous or, or feared or unwanted into something that is sort of, I'm not going to say desired, but it is something that is glorified, uh, that is glorious because the, he died for everyone's sins. And so it's, a, it's, an, act of he, 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 it's an act of glory, basically. And so he, he is undoing or more exactly transcending the original fall of Adam. And that's what, what he's doing. And then you can sort of, and this is more like a bit out there, is that you can even look at it in terms of he, because of Jesus, the Roman Empire, Rome converts to Christianity, much like in order to like to save Cain and Abel, so to save Cain. Like you had two brothers in, in Cain and Abel, one murdered the other, Romus, Romulus and Remus, two brothers, they founded the city, one killed the other, much like Cain and Abel. And then by Rome converting to Christianity, it symbolically represents Cain being saved as well. If you see the similarities in the patterns. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Pegor. Uh, next up is uh, Cheryl, followed by David. Cheryl. Uh, when I go back to Genesis and think of Adam as, um, as being created in God's image, uh, or created in our image, as it actually says. And, um, but being not only the first man, but the first father. And um, Jesus uh, uh, deliberately saying he is the son of man and referring to his father, there's a relationship there that he remains a son. He never becomes a father. The first father was Adam and Jesus remains a son. And uh, he's a servant of man, the son of man. And he constantly refers to himself that way. Um, and I just think that that's, that's the tie. And, I, and Jesus wants to, throughout his whole life, to remain, to keep that unbroken. And to keep himself a virgin like his mother um, uh, at his birth. And, um, and, and, and help us to define what a family is and the roles in a family and how we relate to each other, um, even as we procreate. Um, but I just uh, think those are important. Um, when he is defining the words and what these words mean, father, son, mother, um, and how we are a family and, re and relate to each other. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, next up, uh, thank you, Cheryl. Next up is David, for, followed by Evanique. Uh, David. Yeah, I forgot to mention something before when I was talking, you know, one of two things that, um, you know, the Garden of Eden, let me just say, and also Jesus Christ have in common too, is redemption, you know, because Jesus is all about redemption from the sins that we have through his word. In the Garden of Eden, there were two trees in the midst of the garden. One was a tree of life and the other was a tree of knowledge of good and evil. Okay, and the thing is, when Adam and Eve partook of the tree of good and evil, okay, what they partook of and what they accomplished was uh, the fact that they became like gods. So they became gods within themselves so that they pronounced judgment on everything around them, you know. 
And the thing is, because of that, they could take and supersede the things that were in the tree of understanding or the tree of life, okay? So the thing is, God, you know, condemned them to the soil and went on with the whole story about this and that and everything. But in the meantime, you have to remember that he still left the tree of life for redemption inside the center of the Garden of Eden, okay, in which he put flaming swords on the outside. So he made it so that if they wanted to take and they could repent through understanding of the tree of life that sat in the middle of the Garden of Eden. In that way, the story of Jesus and the story of Adam and Eve are very similar. But the only thing is Jesus goes into some complex detail as to how to accomplish that redemption that is not there in the Garden of Eden. Wonderful. Thank you, David. Uh, Joel. Yeah, it actually, I was just going to say something similar. It's just this, this idea that, um, you know, Adam said no to God and, and, and essentially was, it's a form of disobedience and it's the fallen world and everything, but also the trials and tribulations that actually that what Christ went through in order to say yes, you know, that he didn't necessarily want to say yes. He actually begged God to, you know, to spare him. Uh, so to let this cap, cup pass to another. So this idea that that there was this acceptance um, part of it's it's the complete opposite of Adam's action, so that it, it kind of completes the circle. So as you know, that here's my only son, and my only son is going to say yes, whereas before they said no. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. So, folks, I mean, this is this is just amazing. You know, I'm just so grateful to everybody here. I'm the person who knows least about this in this, you know, all of you. And, and, and I'm just completely blown away by the level of observations, level of discourse, the depth, the breadth, you know, people bringing in. It, it's just it's way, way beyond what I had hope for. So thank you very much. I'm really, really grateful to each one, each and every one of you. Um, and look forward to seeing you Friday. Bye. Thank you, Shurkan. Bye. Thank you, Shurkan. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.